Petrograd, February 1917. Tsar Nicholas II abdicated under pressure from the people. But for Lenin, the revolutionary, getting rid of the Tsar wasn't enough. He needed to establish a new order, communism. He methodically orchestrated his takeover in October 1917, and this would ensure the success of his revolution. He had two lieutenants by his side. They had been there for 30 years and were both promising characters, but were diametrically opposed, Joseph Stalin and Leon Trotsky. But the duel between Stalin and Trotsky had begun a good decade earlier. London, 1907. The Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party. Trotsky and Stalin met for the first time. Trotsky was on the stage, Stalin in the audience. Trotsky's brio both fascinated and exasperated his frustrated comrade Stalin. A slow poison began to seep into their relationship. It was Stalin's first time out of the Caucasus. It was his first time in London, the metropolis of the West. And he couldn't believe his eyes. He was a party delegate at a Congress of the Social Democratic Party that brought together all the stars he had heard talk of in the papers. And he was going to be able to speak to them. And it was clear that Stalin was in awe of Trotsky, something he'd struggled to hide all his life. He was in awe of the man. Stalin had obviously noticed Trotsky. Trotsky was everything he despised, an orator, an extrovert, and a brilliant mind. He wasn't brilliant. Stalin was a very poor orator. When you listen to recordings of him speaking, it's amazing. When he became the leader of the USSR, he'd say a phrase, pause, and everyone would applaud. He drinks some water, he says a second sentence, he stops, and everyone applauds. It's absolutely extraordinary. He's like some kind of machine. Physically, Stalin had a great handicap. He was pockmarked, and he was small. And Trotsky was, of course, physically very imposing. The two revolutionaries fought the Tsarist regime under pseudonyms. Joseph Vissarionovich Dugasvili called himself Stalin, the Man of Steel. He had it all figured out. And Lev Davidovich Bronstein hid under the name of Leon Trotsky. They each dreamed of changing the world, but socially they couldn't have been more different. Trotsky had a supposedly happy childhood in a family that loved him, that cared for him, that supported him through his studies, and which envisaged a great future for him. Whereas Stalin was pretty much born in the gutter, and he was exposed to a great deal of violence in his own home. His father was a drunk who would beat him badly. Stalin is very interesting in terms of the Russian Social Democrats, which became the Bolshevik Party, because he's about the only Bolshevik and the only Social Democrat who was working class. All the others came from families of intellectuals, civil servants. Stalin would never be quite like them. They would always feel that he hadn't had the same education, that he wasn't one of their own. Stalin and Trotsky each grew up in a Russia ruled over by the Tsar. For centuries, this autocratic regime had fostered inequality. The huge majority of the population was made up of peasants and they lived in very poor social and economic conditions. The country dreamed of a different society. Stalin was 20 years old when he embarked upon his revolutionary career. Trotsky was 17. But their struggles took on radically different forms. Through his culture and training, Trotsky had a more intellectual vision of revolution. He loved to debate. He developed theories on ways to take power. 
His analysis was influenced by the great European socialist and Marxist thinkers with whom he was in regular contact. Trotsky, Trotsky was in exile. And in exile, he lived in a socialist society, a high society. He traveled around the whole of Europe, and he rubbed shoulders with all the great revolutionaries, all the great European socialists. He lived a life that was, one might say, in high socialist society. It was during his exile in London that Trotsky met Lenin and became one of his collaborators. His travels and his lengthy discussions with foreign intellectuals drove Trotsky to think of revolution on a global scale. For him, taking power would not be limited to just one country. On the other hand, Stalin, the Georgian, was a provincial man, a willing man who was scorned by the socialist intelligentsia. His only priority was revolution in Russia. For Lenin, Comrade Stalin was the man to carry out the dirty work. His delinquent past was skillfully exploited to fill the party coffers. Stalin blanched at nothing. Extortion, sabotage and robbery posed no problems. He was the revolutionary king of the Caucasus. He played cat and mouse with the police and he pulled off master strokes, hold-ups, ran revolutionary rackets and murdered people. And he played a very important role because it was through these heists and this revolutionary racketeering that he raised the funds to ensure the survival of the Bolshevik faction in exile. Because when you're in exile and you have no income, what else do you do? That's why Lenin referred to him as the wonderful Georgian, the wonderful Georgian who brought in the cash. It was great. In 1913, Stalin and Trotsky met again, this time in Vienna. And this encounter confirmed Stalin's first impressions. He felt snubbed. Stalin had a complex, something gnawing at him that he never got over, his desire to eliminate Trotsky. The hour of revolution was approaching. Although Stalin and Trotsky were now both working for Lenin, it was already clear that beyond the ideals they shared, they were totally opposed to one another. Nineteen seventeen was a pivotal year in the history of the First World War. Russia was fighting alongside France, and the British had been weakened by a conflict that had already been going on for three years. The soldiers were revolting. 1917 was a year of mutiny in the trenches and the start of the Russian Revolution. In February, there were increasing numbers of strikes and protests in Petrograd. The Tsar was forced to abdicate. A provisional government was established, but the Bolsheviks overthrew it a few months later. In October, Lenin took his place at the head of the first communist regime in history. He appointed brilliant revolutionaries to support him. Trotsky, of course, along with Lev Kamenev, Grigory Zinoviev, and Nikolai Bukharin. Stalin, the man of the people, stood out among these intellectuals. In the face of this new regime, the Tsar's partisans dreamed of their return to power. They ended up fighting the Bolsheviks in a civil war that lasted five years. During this struggle, Lenin realized that he needed Trotsky's eloquence and charisma. Stalin was relegated to the background. Trotsky had some eminent qualities. He was a great orator, a great revolutionary, and a great leader of men. Physically, he was scared of nothing. He moved around in his armored train to the front during the Civil War. That wasn't a problem for him. As for Stalin, he was developing his own method. Dans les congrès du Parti Bolshevik ou des Soviets, Trotsky would turn up at Bolshevik or Soviet Party congresses and would stir up the crowd with his brilliant oratory. 
People would applaud and he'd already have left. Stalin would go around shaking hands, paying attention to the lowly militants, being interested in what was happening to them, knowing their names even, all kinds of things that were totally foreign to Trotsky. So Stalin gained a reputation as a good guy. You have to remember that as soon as the Bolsheviks moved from St. Petersburg to Moscow in the spring of 1918 and moved into the Kremlin, Stalin had his own apartments in the Kremlin and worked out of the office next to Lenin's. It was really no coincidence that Lenin appointed him secretary general. He was the party man, close by Lenin's side. And Stalin, in that role, gradually started weaving his network of contacts that would give him free reign over the party officials and their appointment. Stalin understood what he could get out of the party. But for the time being, Trotsky was the hero of the revolution and the civil war. He traveled thousands of miles to rally the troops that would make up the Red Army. On his armored train, Trotsky traveled back and forth across the country using the weapon he understood best, words. He gave hope to the Reds while demoralizing the counter-revolutionary whites. For Trotsky, the train was as much a weapon of war as it was a weapon of propaganda. Each day, he wrote a journal that he had printed on board and he distributed it as he went. Like a real war chief, he shared stories of the soldiers' daily lives, encouraging them and rewarding them. But Trotsky also used force and repression to make men sign up for the Red Army, which went from one million soldiers in 1918 to five million two years later. He had no hesitations about having anyone who opposed him shot. Empowered by his success in Russia, Trotsky hoped to spread revolution across Europe. In 1920, he launched an offensive on the Polish army in Warsaw, which was allied to the white counter-revolutionaries. But just when victory was within his grasp, Stalin thwarted his plans. As head of the Red Army, Trotsky ordered the troops to attack. Tukhachevsky, who was the commander-in-chief, was attacking from east to west, directly on Warsaw. To the south, there was a column under Stalin's command that was supposed to come up from the south directly to Warsaw. But Stalin never listened to anyone else, as usual, and instead of heading for Warsaw to take the Poles in a pincer movement, he stopped in front of a different city and besieged it. He just didn't show up. Rather than obeying orders, Stalin wanted a personal victory by taking the Polish city of Lvov. His stubbornness led to a Soviet defeat. They were subsequently obliged to make important territorial concessions to Poland. Between Stalin and Trotsky, this episode felt like a declaration of war. And there were some fierce disputes after that, which explain what happened next. Because obviously, Lenin demanded reports of what had happened, and Trotsky presented a report that was highly critical of Stalin. Tukhachevsky also presented a report that was highly critical of Stalin. And it goes without saying that comrade Stalin would settle his scores 15 years later. Stalin pondered his revenge, but for the moment, he just had to grin and bear it. Trotsky ensured the Bolsheviks were able to seize power across the country. The Red Army finally defeated the partisan soldiers of the former Tsarist regime, the Whites. But this also reduced Russia to a devastated battleground. In 1921, after a terrible drought, famine ravished the country and 1.5 million people starved to death. However, within the party, Trotsky was at the peak of his popularity. 
He emerged as the natural heir to Lenin, who was seriously ill and who would soon need to be replaced. In his post as Secretary General, Stalin knew that he wasn't a favorite for the job, but he had already planned how he was going to get back in the race. Stalin, who was less brilliant than the others, was nonetheless a remarkable strategist. Not just a remarkable pragmatist, but also a remarkable strategist. He had a veritable strategy for the creation of the Lenin myth, in which he made sure he had his place. Creating the Lenin myth was the Machiavellian idea hatched by Stalin to deflect any criticism and win the battle against Trotsky. His plan had two phases. The first took place on the day of Lenin's funeral. Lenin had been incapacitated by a series of three strokes that had left him weakened, and the founder of Soviet Russia eventually died on the 21st of January, 1924. He was 53. A huge crowd gathered in Gorky, near Moscow, to pay homage to the revolutionary. His faithful companions were also in attendance, Kamenev, Zinoviev, and Bukharin. They carried the coffin along with Stalin. These three Bolsheviks, old friends of Lenin's, may also have been thinking about succeeding him, but what they didn't know was that Stalin was counting on using them to take power for himself and that he had already sealed their own deadly fates. Only one top party figure was missing, Trotsky. Trotsky, Trotsky was fairly seriously ill at the time and was being treated in a seaside resort in the Caucasus. We now know, and they knew at the time, that Stalin had lied to him, telling him not to come back, that there was no point as Lenin would be buried immediately. However, the decision had already been taken to construct a mausoleum. So Trotsky did what Stalin said, thinking he wouldn't get back in time, as it would have taken several days by train. He took a decision not to return, which had lasting consequences. Stalin had organized an absolutely extraordinary funeral. This was a new kind of event. They were no longer in an imperial system, now they were in a revolutionary system. Embalming Lenin, so he could be on display forever, to the bedazzled public, was an aberrant idea, and it came from Stalin. Lenin's widow tried to stop the embalming and the funeral arrangements. She was against it all. And that was when Stalin said, be careful. I can find another widow for Lenin immediately. That was a threat, and not an implicit one. That was what he actually said. Krupskaya, Lenin's widow, had to bow to all of Stalin's wishes. The second phase of his plan to seize power involved Lenin's testament. On the 23rd of May, 1924, four months after the funeral, the 13th Communist Party Congress was held and Stalin read out the document. A few months before he died, aware that he didn't have much time left, the father of the revolution dictated a few words to his secretary. Without specifically naming his successor, Lenin gave his opinion on the qualities and flaws of those Bolsheviks who might succeed him. This is what he said. Comrade Stalin, having become Secretary General, and remember, it was Lenin who appointed Stalin Secretary General in early 1922, a few months earlier. Comrade Stalin, having become Secretary General, has unlimited authority concentrated in his hands. That is a strong statement. He continues, and I am not sure whether he will be capable of using that authority with sufficient caution. And what happened afterwards proves he was right. 
The paradox is that in his testament, Lenin flagged up the dangerous character that Stalin was. But at the time, Stalin was a lesser player in the minds of the three other Bolshevik leaders. Initially, the fight for succession wasn't between Stalin and Trotsky, it was between Trotsky, Zinoviev, Kamenev and Bukharin. And at that time, Stalin was still in the background. So that was between the 23rd and 31st of December. And on the 4th of January, a week later, Lenin was feeling better and said the last thing he would say about this matter. It's pretty amazing what he said. Stalin is too rude. About time, too, that somebody noticed, in the middle of all these extremely rude Bolsheviks, Stalin is too rude. And this defect, although quite tolerable in our midst and in dealings among us communists, becomes intolerable in a secretary general. That is why I suggest that the comrades think about a way of removing Stalin from that post. In this testament, Lenin is much more lenient with Trotsky. Granted, he reproaches his excessive confidence, but he also commends his intellectual qualities. He presents him as the most capable man in the Central Committee. However, Trotsky would never profit from Lenin's appreciation. Against all expectations, it was Stalin who pushed his advantage. Stalin was very cunning. He staged the revelation of Lenin's will and said, Comrades, the last words of Comrade Lenin, etc. Comrade Lenin said, I should be removed from my post, so therefore, I propose to resign from my post. And of course, because it was he who organized the Congress, all the Congress cried out, Comrade Stalin, no, stay with us. It was a nice little show. And so faced with that situation, Trotsky was stuck. And this is what he said, and what finished him off for good. We can only be right with and by the party. Clearly, the party is always right. Of course, if the party is run by Stalin, then it's Stalin who will always be right. From that point on, he created a kind of legacy for Lenin. He created Leninist thinking. That was what they called it. Like the thinking of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and then Stalin too. So while Lenin himself was recommending the utmost caution with regard to Stalin, Stalin pulled off the amazing feat of emerging as his heir. Trotsky realized that he had underestimated Stalin and there were more surprises in store for him. In 1926, Stalin and Trotsky met up at the burial of a former Bolshevik, Jerzinski, someone to whom they'd been close. Stalin was walking up ahead, Trotsky farther behind. The man who had led the revolution a decade previously no doubt knew that his days high up in the party were now numbered. This was the last time that Stalin and Trotsky would appear together in public. Now that the civil war had left millions dead, Stalin, like the majority of the Bolsheviks, had abandoned the idea of a global revolution. However, this was still an obsession for Trotsky. He wanted to take up arms again. Stalin had understood that in the country, as within the Communist Party, it was not the right time to export the revolution. Because the people in this system wanted a quiet life. They wanted to benefit from the advantages that Stalin, as secretary of the Central Committee, had granted. These were material advantages, advantages in a country that was hungry. Remember, the USSR had always known shortages. So having a job where you have material advantages, a food parcel every month, or a salary that is doubled, then tripled, then quadrupled, etc., was very important. And what's Trotsky going to say to those people? That they have to help the revolution in Germany? In China? In Britain? 
No, leave us in peace. It's the same for any political machinery. They want to be left in peace. Stalin, il avait. Stalin had a very good understanding of the triggers of human psychology. And I think that with a certain number of people who were of a similar character to him, he knew how to manipulate the triggers of ambition, the triggers of jealousy, envy, the triggers for violence. He knew how to bring out the psychological traits in these people that would drive them to action, to action for Stalin's own benefit. To reach the very top of the party, Stalin had to use the members of the Politburo and play them off against each other. First, he managed to convince Zinoviev and Kamenev to team up with him to sideline Trotsky. Then his manipulation continued. He got Bukharin on side against Trotsky, Zinoviev and Kamenev. He was a brilliant dissembler and slowly but surely managed to rid himself of all the old Bolshevik revolutionaries in his way. At the same time, he used his position as secretary general to appoint people he could manipulate. He even went as far as to organize an intake dedicated to Lenin of low-ranking soldiers into the party, which until then had been the reserve of the elite of 1917. It was in fact a key position because it allowed Stalin, through a succession of brilliantly managed appointments, to gradually replace those who had led the revolution, and the civil war especially, by a certain number of accomplices who owed their careers to him. They owed their careers not to their revolutionary achievements, but to the Prince of Moscow, Stalin himself. Stalin created a court of the faithful. However much Trotsky denounced the bureaucratization of the party, However much he criticized Stalin for being a man of the system, it was too late. The Tsar's trap had remorselessly closed around the prophet. Trotsky was his own worst enemy, a victim of his remarkable intelligence, of his brilliant mind that had indisputably led him, like others, to underestimate Stalin. He is mediocrity, Trotsky said. That's how he described Stalin. Never in history have we seen such a host of brilliant, cultivated and extraordinary minds that shared the same aim to destroy the old order and establish a new one. And among them, there was mediocrity. And it was the mediocrity that won the day. In 1927, Stalin settled his score with Trotsky. He expelled him from the party. Trotsky was then sent by force to Alma Ata in deepest Kazakhstan. Stalin wanted to rid himself of his rival, but he couldn't kill him, not yet. Barely 10 years after the Russian Revolution, nobody in the party understood such a decision. Then Stalin exiled Trotsky, chasing him out of the Soviet Union. Trotsky didn't know then that he'd never return to his country again. Although it seemed that Stalin had won over the party, the confrontation between the two men was far from finished. The duel would continue long distance. Mm -hmm. 